Hello everyone, hope you are all doing well today. I have here with me chapter 14 of book 2 of the Royal Ranger series, the Red Fox Clan, and we're going to go ahead and get into it. It was close to midday when the little company rode out of the trees onto grassy flatland. Beyond the knee-high grass that waved gently in the breeze, Horace could see the silver sparkle of water stretching for several hundred meters to the north. That's the Wessel, he said. Gillen nodded acknowledgement. And there are our two scouts, he replied, indicating the two mounted troopers waiting by the river bank. Horace turned in his saddle and beckoned the troop leader forward. The lieutenant trotted his horse up to them. Protocol dictated that while they were marching, he would stay a reasonable distance away from the two commanders, allowing them to speak in relative privacy. He saluted as he drew rein alongside them. Wait here, Horace told him, then indicated the two scouts several hundred meters away. We'll check with the scouts, and if it's all clear, we'll signal you forward. Are you planning to stop here for a while, sir? The lieutenant asked. Horace squinted up at the sun, almost directly overhead. We might as well rest the horses, and the archers, he added with a grin. The archers, being unmounted, marched in the rear of the cavalry. But wait till we hear what the scouts have to say. Yes, sir. The lieutenant touched his hand to the rim of his iron helmet, then turned away and issued commands to his troop. Stay mounted, but sit at rest, he told them. The troopers eased their tired legs, standing in their stirrups and stretching their muscles. The archers, who accompanied them, simply sat or lay on the grass at the edge of the track, with sighs of relief. Horace and Gillen urged their mounts into a canter and rode toward the scouts. Looks as if everything's all right, Gillen observed. Had the scouts intended to warn them of any danger, they would have signaled so by now. As it was, they sat at ease and waited for the two commanders to come up with them. It was Horace's operation, so Gillen left it to him to question the two riders. Where are the foxes? Horace asked. Since early that morning, following a tip-off from a village they had passed through, they had been shadowing a small group of members of the Red Fox clan. There were half a dozen of them, and they had been moving at a brisk pace through the wooded country, consistently heading north. Must be going somewhere, Gillen had noted. Horace had grunted assent. Obviously, the foxes were going somewhere, he thought, but he realized that Gillen had meant they had a definite destination in mind. In spite of the vagaries of the track through the forest they had been following, they had maintained a base course that traveled consistently north. Now, the broad, deep waters of the Wessel prohibited any further progress in that direction. The foxes must have turned either east or west, and presumably the two scouts had waited to apprise Horace and Gillen of their quarry's new course. The senior of the two scouts, who wore Corporal's rank insignia on the chest of his jerkin, saluted briskly. Horace nodded acknowledgement and briefly touched his forehead with his forefinger. He wasn't much for parade ground drill, Gillen noted with a private smile. Sir, said the corporal briskly, we followed them here to the river's edge. Then they turned east, following the bank. He indicated the direction they had taken with a pointing arm. Do they know you were following them? Horace asked. The corporal hesitated. Hard to tell, sir, he said. They didn't seem to know we were behind them. We stayed well back. Of course, he added. It was easier to stay concealed when we were in the trees. They could have spotted us when we reached this open ground. Horace considered the man's answer for a few seconds. Short of having the six fox members spur off at full gallop, there was no way of ascertaining whether they had spotted their followers. Hmm, he said. How long since they reached this point? The two scouts exchanged a glance, and then the corporal replied, Half an hour, sir. Twenty minutes at least. He looked back at his companion again. Would you say so, Ned? The second trooper nodded. Twenty minutes at least, sir. 
Horace glanced to the east, in the direction the small party had gone, and came to a decision. Very well. Get back on their tail, he said. Stay well back. He indicated the tree line several hundred meters away. You can stay back in the trees. Yes, sir, the corporal replied. Horace continued with his orders. We'll take a ten-minute break here and follow on after you. If there's anything to report, or if they change direction again, one of you ride back to tell us. Yes, sir, the troopers chorused. Horace waved them away. Right, get moving, but be careful. Odds are they're heading for some meeting point or rendezvous, and we don't want to frighten them off. The two troopers cantered slowly away, their horses' hoofs thudding dully on the soft grass. Horace turned in his saddle, whistled, and then waved for the rest of the party to join them. Gillen unhooked his canteen from the saddlebow in front of him and took a long drink. Might as well stretch our legs, Horace told him. Then, as the troop arrived, with the archers straggling loosely behind, he addressed the lieutenant. Ten minutes, Burton, he told him. Let the men dismount and loosen saddle girths. Check the horses for any signs of lameness or galling. The lieutenant nodded, then turned and issued his orders to the troop. The cavalrymen swung down from their saddles and began to check their mounts. It was standard procedure to make sure the horses were in good shape before they attended to their own needs. Each man was leading a spare horse, and they were checked as well, although, without being burdened by a saddle or a rider, there was little chance that they would need any form of treatment. As before, the archers simply sprawled on the grass where they stood. There were, after all, some advantages to traveling on foot. Horace grinned at them. Undisciplined lot they are, he said. Gillen followed his gaze and replied seriously. Maybe, but they're good men in a battle. Let's hope so, the tall knight replied. We might need them before long. After the ten-minute break was over, measured by the troop sergeant with a small sand glass, the men tightened their saddle girth straps and remounted. Grumbling, the archers came to their feet and stood ready in a loose formation. Horace raised his right hand to shoulder height, then lowered it in the direction he wanted them to travel. Move them out, lieutenant, he said, and once again the little force was on the move. They traveled for another hour, walking the horses so that the archers could keep up. There was no complaints from the bowmen. They were used to going on foot. Their feet and leg muscles were hardened to the task, and they managed a brisk pace that kept them level with the horsemen. They paralleled the river bank, as Gillen and Horace had predicted back at Castle Erluin. It formed an effective barrier, keeping the party ahead of them from crossing. Gillen held up a hand and the column stopped. What is it? said Horace. Then he saw for himself, as his eyes followed Gillen's outstretched arm. The two scouts were reined in on the bank of the river, waiting for them. They were about three hundred meters ahead. You've got sharp eyes, he told the ranger commandant. Something's happened. Wonder why one of them didn't ride back to warn us, said Gillen. The reason soon became apparent, as they spurred their horses to join the scouts. They got away, sir, the corporal said apologetically. Horace's brows drew together in annoyance. Got away? How? I told you to stay back out of sight, didn't I? And we did, sir. But I think they've been on to us the whole time, only they never let on. There was a boat waiting for them here. He indicated a shallow, sandy beach at the river's edge took them on board, and rode them across the river. We couldn't do anything about it, sir. We were staying back, and they'd got on board before we knew what was happening. Horace let his breath out in an exasperated sigh. Can't be helped, Corporal, he said. Not your fault. As you say, it seems they've been on to us the whole time. He twisted in his saddle. Lieutenant, he called, beckoning for the officer to join them. As the man rode up, Horace indicated the cavalrymen. Are any of your men raised in these parts? he asked. I'd like to know if there's a ford anywhere close by. The lieutenant looked doubtful. Not sure, sir, 
Most of them came from the south originally. But I'll ask around. No need, Gillen said. One of the archers grew up here. Used to be a poacher before he signed up with the archers. He should know the area. He raised his voice. Archer Ellis, come here, please. Ellis, a nuggety man in his mid-thirties, heaved himself to his feet. Like the others, he had taken the opportunity to sprawl on the grass by the river bank. He hurried forward now. Gillen noted approvingly that he brought his longbow with him. No archer worth his salt would ever leave it behind when on campaign. Ellis saluted, touching the knuckles of his right hand to his forehead. Yes, ranger, he said smartly. Gillen commanded the respect of the archers. As a ranger, Gillen's skill with the bow was far superior to their own, and they recognized the fact. You were raised around here, weren't you? Used to be a poacher, I'm told, Gillen said. Instantly, Ellis assumed a look of shocked innocence. Me, sir? A poacher, sir? Nay, I never touched one of the king's animals. It's a wicked lie folks tell about me it is. Gillen said nothing, simply stared down at the man with a look of utter disbelief on his face. Ellis shifted his feet uncomfortably, then eventually admitted, Well, maybe once. Twice, even. I might have accidentally shot a rabbit or a hare. Accidentally, I say. And once it was shot, weren't no sense to leave it lying all around, was there? Oh, get over yourself, Ellis. I don't care if you shot half a hundred deer while you were at it. The question is, how well do you know this area? Ellis glanced around, as if seeing the river, the grassy plain, and the forest for the first time. Why, like the back of my hand, sir, he said, relieved that the question of his former illegal activities was not Gillen's main interest. So are there any fords close by? Gillen asked. Ellis pursed his lips, considering. Not particularly close, sir. Nearest is a good two kilometers from here. And it's a difficult crossing, sir. How's that? Horace interposed. Ellis turned his gaze to the tall warrior. It's fast running, sir. Like the rest of the river, and it's quite deep, maybe chest high. He indicated with his right hand, a point just below the collar of his jerkin. Man can get swept off his feet easy as blinking, he added. But if you could hold on to one of the horses while you crossed, would that be easier? Horace said. Ellis considered his answer for a few seconds, then grinned. Yes, be easy as pie then, I'd say. If the horse were upstream, it would break the force of the current, and it would provide a stable handhold for a man crossing beside it. Good, said Horace. He nodded his thanks to Ellis. Well, I suggest you lead the way to this ford of yours. We need to get across the river and pick up the trail of those foxes again. He looked at Gillen. I trust you'll be able to manage that? Gillen shrugged. Shouldn't be a problem. Behind them, the cavalry lieutenant coughed discreetly. Sir Horace? They turned to look at him. He was pointing to the tree line, several hundred meters distant. Armed men were emerging from the trees and forming up in three ranks. A lot of armed men. I think we're in trouble, Horace said. All right, that is going to be the end of chapter number 14. Thank you, everyone, who chose to join me. I will see you all next time in chapter 15. God bless, and have a good one.